Well, hello and welcome. Uh, we continue today uh, reading the fifth chapter of uh, T.M. Scannon's book, What We Owe to, uh, to Each Other. It's about the structure of contractualism, which is basically the philosophy, um, the ethical philosophy uh, of uh, T.M. Uh, T.M. Scanlon. And we already started this last, uh, last week. Uh, we explained what what basically is contractualism for T.M. Uh, Scanlon, and we, uh, we, uh, we argued that contractualism basically means that you owe your reasons for doing, uh, for doing things or holding certain beliefs to other people, and those reasons must be backed up by principles. Uh, is there a principle that we can reject or not? And so we we've seen what constitutes a reasonable rejection of a principle. The question now becomes on what ground can we really reject a principle. So usually we often go to the consequences of that principle, but as we've seen when we talked about uh, teleological values, this doesn't have to be the case all the time. Sometimes we can reject a principle uh, that makes it impossible to recognize other values that one uh, has reasons to recognize. A principle based on a radical impartiality, for example, would make it impossible to recognize the values of friendship, uh, for example, in taking uh, decisions. So in that sense, principles can be rejected on grounds of personal values. Uh, these are also values that are involved uh, with uh, the issue, the issues of fairness, which we discussed, uh, which we already discussed. Um, we reject principles of arbitrariness and unfairness because they privileged uh, individuals without justification. And so the reasons we reject these principles are based on personal values because, quote, they have to do with the claims and status of individuals in certain positions. So we uh, no personal values can be a good way to reject principles, but what about impersonal values? Can there be good reasons to reject a principle based on impersonal uh, grounds? So surely we can admit that some things that are, um, some things are valuable in their own right without appealing to the interest of individuals. We've discussed uh, many times that uh, preserving the beauty of natural landscape is something we have reasons to uh, to do, rarely because it suits someone's personal interests. We've mentioned this when we talked about morality in a broader sense, for example. Um, so if there are reasons to value impersonal things and so to preserve them, we can say that uh, these impersonal values can also be good grounds for rejecting principles or licensing some actions that can destroy those things, right? Uh, we can oppose the building of a dam on a river because the river is valuable. Now, Skellen argues that while impersonal values are a thing, they unfortunately can't be uh, good grounds for rejecting principles. Uh, the reason is that morality, as uh, as far as Kellen is concerned, is about what we owe to each other uh, and so what we owe to individuals. Now, I'm going to oppose the building of a dam. Uh, if I'm going to, uh, to do that, I can only do it on grounds that others cannot reject. So what this means is that on their own, imp uh, that their own uh, impersonal values are ins uh, ins uh, insufficient. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they have no role to play in justification. On the contrary, they can be uh, grounds for the sufficient justification. Like, um, like we've seen with uh, with morality in the narrow, uh, in the narrow and the broader sense, uh, they they both depend on uh, on each other. Although what we owe to each other is uh, morality in a narrow sense, it depends on morality in the broader uh, the broader sense. So it's the same thing here. So although personal values are what is decisive in moral argumentation, they can still depend on impersonal values. Quote, impersonal reasons do not themselves provide grounds for, reason for reasonably rejecting a principle, but these reasons do play a significant role in determining other grounds for reasonable rejection. So, um, simply put, uh, I oppose the building of a dam because the river is valuable in itself, but because the river is valuable, then others can appreciate its beauty. And that appreciation is something that is desirable, that others, like me, have reasons to value, and so I owe it to them that they can also enjoy and appreciate the river. 
if they want to go hiking or canoe uh, or uh, canoeing, uh, canyoning, canoeing, sorry, canoeing, or fishing, uh, even maybe swimming, these are valuable things, and so we preserve the ri the river for that. Same with, you know, preserving species. We do it because animals are beautiful and a great source of knowledge, uh, of mystery and awe. These are valuable to others, to other human, uh, human beings, and so I owe it to them that wildlife is uh, preserved. And so these are personal reasons. But as he says, their force as reasons depends uh, in part on further judgment of impersonal value, namely, uh, namely the judgment that these uh, objects are worth seeing and should be admired. So we can also oppose a principle on grounds that it would affect our uh, practical reasoning, like it would limit, it, uh, limit our practical reasoning and make us unable to recognize values that have reasons to be recognized. Uh, and Scanlon insists on making us unable here. A principle can permit one to neglect things we have reasons to recognize, but permitting means that uh, it's just a possibility that you fail to recognize those things or values. So that's not a good ground for rejecting it as long as it only permits one to neglect some values or, or things. After all, we can make uh, a case in which a certain value is not owed to others. We can say that neglecting to see that something is valuable can be reasonably defended. Uh, surely we can owe all values and everything that can be valuable to others all the time. Uh, what we can do is just to always make, uh, make sure that there is room for the possibility of someone to claim that a certain value uh, that is neglected is actually owed to them, uh, as long as they provide good reasons for that claim. Quote, genuine conflict can arise, however, in the case of principles that do not merely license people to ignore impersonal values, but forbid them from taking these values into account or limit the role that they can have in uh, justifying actions. So, um, such cases can include a principle that prevents us from intervening against someone else's actions when that action can destroy a uh, natural landscape. Uh, such a principle can make us unable to appreciate nature and so it can be rejected. Uh, others can be... Uh it uh, can be a principle that puts uh, that puts a duty on someone to save someone's life, even if the means can cause the extinction of a species, for example, or a duty to keep a promise, even if that would demand torturing an animal, etc. So principles like these, uh, in these cases, a generic reason can be rejected because they prevent individuals to appreciate things that they would have enjoyed otherwise, right? So. Uh, this is a uh, perfect example of, you know, uh, interplay between personal and impersonal values, where the things valued are not valued because they contribute to someone's personal well, uh, well-being. Uh, like uh, Scanlon says in a footnote, well-being is not a master value. Uh, the value of uh, other things do not always derive from the fact that they make individuals' lives better, but if these things are valuable, then recognizing them does contribute to the quality of people's lives. From an individual's point of view, what is primary is mo uh, in most cases is the impersonal value of these uh, aims and pursuits. In determining what we owe to each other, however, what matters is the contribution that these values make to individual lives. So, to sum up, uh, impersonal values are not good enough to reject principles, but because they provide people with reasons to want to live a certain way, they are good grounds for personal reasons to reject principles. So, with this in mind, we can move on to the next section, which is a very important uh, section uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this chapter. So, basically so far we talked about personal and impersonal values and we concluded that while personal values are good grounds for rejecting principles, impersonal values, well, they cannot, they cannot do that, at least not on their own. But not every personal value can be a good reason to reject the principle, so we need to see what kind of personal reason uh, can be sufficient to do that. And a classical case of personal values rejecting principles are the values of the worst off. Uh, if I'm poor, oppressed, discriminated against, etc., my personal values would have more priority to reject principle, the principles than uh, someone who is doing okay, right? Um, well, this is what Scanlon turns to in uh, the eighth uh, section of, uh, of the chapter. Um, 
it is, you know, uh, the priority to the worst uh, to the worst off. He asks, in assessing the strength of generic reasons for and against a principle, should special weight be given to reasons arising from the standpoint of those who would be worst off, uh, worst off overall, if their claim uh, were not uh, accepted? So, a lot of moral theories, uh, inc uh, including contractualism, would answer yes to this question. Scanlon himself wrote, uh, wrote so in a previous essay that he uh, mentions in a footnote. Uh, the essay is entitled, Contra uh, is in is titled uh, Contractualism and Utilitarianism, and in it Scanlon says, under contractualism, when we consider a principle, uh, our attention is naturally directed first at those who, uh, who would do worst uh, under it. But, as he also says, not all forms of contractualism have this idea of giving the priority to, uh, to the worst off. Um, these forms of contractualism simply state that uh, what's provided for people is just protection and assurances against uh, intentional harms, and that's it. Uh, you may be worst off, but as long as no one is intentionally harming you, there is no reason to consider your personal reasons as relevant in rejecting principles. So, the idea of priority to the worst off seems to be a contingent feature of contractualism and not a, a necessary one. Uh, it's, uh, it's more about whether or not the fact that someone is worst, uh, worst uh, off uh, can serve as a serve as a good reason to reject a generic reason and not about the structure of contractualism itself but that holds if the structure uh, if the if the contractualism in question is just about uh, protection from intentional uh, harm uh, when it uh, when it comes about the uh, distribution of specific goods or access to important uh, goods the complaints of the worst off have more substantive force uh, this form of contractualism is more appealing since it states that when you can help uh, for a small sacrifice, then you have to help. And so such, uh, such principle would state, quote, Our duties in such uh, cases would hold that if you are presented with a situation in which you can prevent so something very bad from happening or alleviate someone's dire plight by making only a slight or even moderate sacrifice, then it would be wrong not to do so. So, uh, Scanlon calls this the rescue principle, and at first glance it seems pretty convincing and can be reasonably uh, rejected. We can also have uh, principles uh, not of rescue but of help, uh, helpfulness. When you have to, uh, when you have some information, for example, that you that you know the other person would need for their goals, uh, the principle of helpfulness states that you have to give them that information, even though their lives uh, isn't really at stake, like in in the rescue uh, principle. Uh, this is a principle that we certainly can use more in our capitalist and competitive societies. Uh, and so, a big thank you to Saiha, Blibjen, and Anders Archive for those uh, for those who know. Um, so, of course, such principles can be uh, cannot be uh, intrusive, meaning that they cannot become unrealistically demanding. Like uh, I can never. Put, uh, put forth my own interests, for example, if, if the principle demands that I, can, that I can never put forth my own interests, uh, the principle becomes unrealistic. Uh, this can be intolerable to always, uh, to always have to uh, put the interest of others before, uh, before mine. Uh, the point is, however, uh, however, you, uh, however you look uh, at the problem, it cannot be from an impersonal perspective because from impersonal perspectives all principles would become intrusive. So both the rescue principle and the helpfulness principle uh, avoid this intrusiveness by being specific. Uh, both argue that we have to take uh, other people's interests into account when we can easily do so. Uh, the first one can only be applicable in cases where someone is actually capable of rescuing someone and uh, at a cost that won't be uh, crippling for them. Uh, the rescue principle doesn't say that you have to sacrifice an arm to save a stranger, for example. Uh, so with such principles in mind, we can hardly see how the priority for the worst off can be avoided. Um, but some can still say no, like the priority of the worst off can't always be justified under these principles. Uh, Thomas Nigel, for example, argues that when you are confronted between uh, confronted between two uh, two choices of helping either someone who is already better off and someone who is worse off, uh, you can uh, choose uh, the one who is better off. Uh, at 
And the reason is that if your help will have a greater impact on the person who is better off in terms of overall quality of their lives, like from uh, from birth to death, then uh, then you know uh, then the one who is who is worse off, then the better off is the one who uh, who should get the priority. So you're not uh, we're not talking about a small improvement here, but one that is so significant that we can give priority to the one who is already better off. So for uh, Nigel, priority isn't given to uh, the worse off or to the better off, but to whomever we have more chances to make a positive impact on their lives as a whole, like from birth to, uh, to death. Um, so does Kellen accept this for contractualism? Like, can we give priority to whomever would benefit more uh, from it? Well. Not necessarily. Uh, Scanlon says that it depends on the standpoint of those who are worse off. Determining the extent of a positive impact isn't something that we can easily do since it has a big subjective component uh, to it. If you have someone who is uh, in too much pain, but you know that you can only reduce their pain, like uh, they'll always live in pain and no matter how much you reduce it, it's still going to be deeply painful, uh, like not intolerable but not mild either uh, and you have someone uh, you have someone else who has a mild pain that maybe is preventing them from performing some art uh, some art form and that they are passionate about that like for example someone who is passionate about dancing but they cannot perform dancing because of some uh, because of some chronic pain um, according to Nigel priority should be giving to the second one but from the point of view of the guy who is uh, constantly in an unbearable pain, it can send the message that no one cares about him because, you know, the, uh, the dancer can still manage to have a good life with a mild pain, even though they won't be dancing. Uh, like, I mean, they still can have a good life if they don't do what they are passionate about. But the person who is, you know, in, uh, in suffocating pain, well, I mean, for them, it's not really... Uh, uh, it's not really, uh, uh, it's not really, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not really helpful. Uh, so having the priority over, uh, over, you know, the uh, the the person who is uh, who who wants who wants wants dancing over the person who is uh, uh, who is worse off uh, can be extremely insensitive. As Kellen says, it is often difficult to distinguish between the moral importance of differences in the degree to which people can be helped and differences in how, bad, uh, how badly off they will be if not helped. Since a given chance, a change is a change is often a greater benefit to someone who is worse off. So, giving priority to someone just because we can somehow determine, uh, determine that they are uh, having a good life or a happy life over someone whose life is a catastrophe doesn't seem uh, reasonable. Uh, imagine, the, imagine the same case with a medical treatment that can make the guy in pain uh, experience just one month without pain, but the treatment is given to uh, the dancer instead. Uh, the guy can object to this by claiming that he deserves at least to know what it feels like to live without pain, even if it just for 30 days. So for Scanlon, the priority uh, to the uh, to the worst off uh, still holds um, still holds in this scenario as long as we can provide reasons for it that others cannot reject. Those uh, include that we can help uh, the worst off and that we can do it easily and with uh, the goal to alleviate. Uh, only not with the goal of improving someone's life as a whole. Uh, the kind of priority that Nigel talks about is a priority of well-being understood in a broader sense. But some theories do hold priority to the worst uh, for the worse off, uh, basing its justification on well-being. Uh, consider the uh, difference principle uh, as presented by John Rawls. So the difference principle states that quote. As equal participants in a system of social cooperation, the members of a society have a prima facie claim to an equal share in the benefits it creates. So this means that people are entitled to some standards of living that if they fall below it, they're entitled to receiving help from others in order to alleviate their plight. Uh, they're not entitled to that help in terms of uh, uh, human humanitarian concern for their plight, but because the institutions that uh, supposedly assure that they uh, that they're right to that minimum standards of, uh, of living are failing them. Uh, they are receiving less than equal shares of benefits to which they have a prima facie equal claim. 
And so Rome's principle is about institutions and how, uh, and how well they perform in securing the social goods for individuals. But if uh, being worse off is determined by access to such goods, then uh, we're, still, uh, we're still understanding being worse off in terms of well-being and in terms of the quality of life as a whole. It's about justice and not about individual conduct. So Nigel too has uh, this component of equality in his, in his model. Uh, uh, Nigel argues that individuals should give priority to those who are worse off uh, through no fault of their own. He emphasizes the moral importance of addressing the needs of those who are um, disadvantaged uh, due to factors beyond their control, such as natural talents or the circumstances of their birth. Um, but Scanlon's model of contractualism goes beyond this, since it just, uh, it's just limited to the reasons we have for prioritizing the worst off. So Scanlon's model is very similar to, uh, to the model from another philosopher uh, named Derek Parfit, and the model is called the complaint model. Okay, this is how Parfit calls his, his model, and according to this model, a person's complaint against a principle must have to do with its effects on him or her. And someone can reasonably reject a principle if there is some alternative to which no other person has a complaint that, uh, that is as uh, strong. So, if you are the worst off, for example, you have reasons to complain about a principle that is uh, maintaining you in that position. Your standpoint counts as a reason to reject that said principle. But Skellen highlights that uh, the differences between Parfit's model and his, uh, saying that there are two differences between the, uh, like I mean, the, 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 there are two differences between uh, the complaint model of Parfit and Skellen's contractualism. Uh, first, Parfit's model is based on complaint on grounds of well-being. Again. A person has reason to complain if the principle they reject is affecting negatively their well-being. Um, Scanlon, however, argues that a complaint can still be uh, legitimate even though it doesn't make you worse, uh, worse off. A principle can treat you unfairly without negatively impacting on your well-being, but still you can object to that principle on the grounds that it is unfair. It doesn't mean that all complaints of unfairness are valid, of course. The point is just to say that you can find many valid reasons to complain about the principle other than using your well-being as um, as a justification. Um, that and this brings us to the second uh, departure for, uh, from uh, the complaint uh, model, um, which is that uh, Parfit's model restricts complaint to simply the direct effects of a principle uh, that the principle has on, on someone. Uh, Parfit can miss that principles are always within the frameworks of other bigger and more abstract principles which don't affect you directly but they do so indirectly. Uh, principles like private property, for example, if you think as a Marxist, don't affect you directly but they lay a framework, a social framework, in which other principles like those of of the police or the carceral system do affect you directly if you don't have access to private property uh, or to the means of production and are just you know uh, and are just dispensable when you when your uh, when your uh, force uh, when your labor force is no longer needed. So uh, Scanlon departs from Parfit because um, because of something he uh, he refuses to uh, to give up, which is its uh, contractualism. Uh, it's, uh, it's, its insistence that the subject uh, that the justifiability of a principle of a moral principle god damn it of a moral principle depends only on various individuals reasons for objecting to that principle and alter alternatives to it so because of that central feature in contractualism the complaint model is too restrictive or more precisely it has uh, some disturbing implications which we also find in consequentialism and utilitarianism that is their mode of justification is at base an aggregative one the sum of certain sort of value is to be maximized so that value cannot of course be anything it doesn't uh Sorry, uh, that value can, uh, of course, be anything. 
Uh, it doesn't have to be well-being, but it can also be equality, for example. Uh, the point is, aggregative justifications are always about the maximization of a certain value. I can justify doing X because that would maximize a certain value that I take for granted that everyone will have equal reasons as I do for maximizing it. So this principle would allow, uh, would allow to put a high, almost inhumane cost of a, uh, on, on, a few, on a few people if the outcome is the maximization of a certain value to the majority of people. Uh, so an aggregate uh, justification would be paradoxical for a complaint model. It's uh, paradoxical because those who will complain need to prove that by being uh, spared of the principle, not just them, but everyone else would benefit from rejecting the principle. But that's, uh, that's the thing. Those who are worst off shouldn't have to reject a principle simply on the ground that those, even if it is the majority, those who are benefiting from, uh, from it would benefit more or get, you know, everyone's approval. So in Scanlon's contractualism, uh, where, uh, where objections can be raised by single individuals from their own standpoints, they can block aggregative justifications. It allows for those who are the, the most burdened by principles to reject them without having to appeal to how much benefits others would gain by uh, agreeing with them. Like, uh, like we said, a principle can be objected to on the grounds that it is just unfair. Right, but Skellen is aware of the limits of contractualism regarding uh, aggregate, uh, aggregative uh, justifications. Um, of course, there are many cases where an aggregative justification is not only uh, appropriate but more efficient than others or more intuitive than others. Uh, if we have two groups of people who are going to uh, sustain uh, the same pain, it would be wrong to uh, to not to include reasons of saving the group with the greatest number. Uh, obviously, whatever, uh, whatever would produce more pain or more deaths here is ultimately wrong and should be ruled out immediately. Uh, contractualism, on the other hand, seems to hold that the number of people affected by something has no weight in moral uh, arguments, which is, of course, wrong. Uh, how many people would suffer from an action makes a moral difference about the nature of that action. But Scanlon has ways to respond to this objection. Um, the first response would be to say that whatever applies, uh, whatever applies to the individual also applies to the group. Uh, that means that what contractualism is suffering from here is that it asks individuals, not groups, to provide justifications or reasons to reject principles. But Scanlon's contractualism can extend to groups as well. Um, a group can reject a principle on grounds that it cannot be reasonably rejected. So even a group can have a generic reason too, not just individuals. But he contends that this response, uh, like giving to a group, wouldn't appeal to consequentialism since a group is likely to argue on the basis of numbers. So there is a second response, uh, and it is to claim that saving the smaller group isn't wrong if the reasons we have to save the smaller group are reasons in the narrow sense of morality, that is, reasons about what we owe to each other. But then Skellen says that it would be uh, arbitrary to suddenly confine morality to just what we owe to each other when we already establish that morality is broader than that. So. The second uh, response needs to be some sort of hybrid, and lucky for us, contractualism itself is a hybrid theory, since it also relies on non-contractualist theories, as we've, uh, as we've seen many times. So, in the case of the two groups, the second response should take the following form. Recognizing the value of human life uh, involves not only acting on principles that can be justified to others, but also seeing that within the constraints set by these principles, there are reasons to act so as to minimize injuries and deaths. And what we have to do isn't just to, uh, isn't just to say uh, that we need these two sides without any link between them, like uh, they just coexist with each other. We need to make it so that they make sense with each other. Uh, the recognizing and the seeing must be coherent with each other, or, uh, or as he puts it, it is worth looking for an, ac an account in which the case for aggregation and the constraints on it are grounded in a unified conception of the consideration owed to each individual. 
So as a reminder, the, aggr the aggregate justification relies on the maximization of some value, like well-being, and takes well-being as a reason not to cause harm or injury. On that account, contractualism can too argue against causing harm on, uh, or injury, uh, but without relying on well-being. It can say that it's out of duty in certain situations that individuals or groups cannot harm others. But the problem is, in cases where one has uh, such duty towards two groups, but one of, uh, of them is going to get, uh, to get hurt and there, is no, uh, and there is no way to stop the hurt. When we owe uh, both groups the same duties, what can we do in that situation? Uh, what would be uh, a better justification than one group is bigger than the other and therefore uh, it's better to let the smaller, uh, the smaller group suffer than the bigger one, right? So, if Scanlon's principle would allow someone to save only one group, one has two people and the other has four, and the group that has, uh, and the group that, sorry, and the group that can be saved on Scanlon's account is the group with two people, despite the fact that there are no differences between the two groups, like I have no special ties to the people of the smaller group, I owe them the same thing that I owe to the people to the, uh, to, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the people in the group uh, in which there are four or four people. If Scanlon allows me to save two people, then there is something wrong with Scanlon's account because what possible reason can I have for saving two people but not four people? You know, if I save four, well, I have a reason, right? Because better save four lives than two lives. But if I save the two, how can I justify that? If I save the two or between, you know, one person and two people, I choose to save the one and let the two die. I have some explaining to do here. So let's say I can save, uh, I can only save either person A or person B and person C. My choice is between either A, just a person A, or two, two people, B and C. So clearly my deciding to save just one person, uh, by deciding that, I fail to consider the positive life of, for example, person C. Uh, C then would have good reasons to reject to me. This is from the perspective of the bigger group. C would say that uh, I wasn't fair because I didn't give uh, C some, uh, some weight or consideration as I did to A, when there is nothing that would distinguish A from B and from C. Uh, so again, A, B and C are not my friends, they are not my spouse, they are not my family, they should all be giving the same weight in this decision. So the lives are owed the same equal, uh, the equal uh, moral significance, but apparently because I decided to save A, maybe, they, uh, maybe they, uh, they don't have the same moral significance. So how am I going to justify this? So of course one can point here to what uh, the philosopher Shelley Keegan called the additive fallacy. When you think that just because something is more uh, morally relevant doesn't necessarily mean that it adds uh, weight to a decision, but as Kellen points in a footnote, in the case we're looking at here, the presence of a third person is a moral relevance that does play the role of the decisive uh, force here because, again, uh, there are no special ties between the people involved in this case. So, we can say uh, that here we're trying to reject the following principle. Any principle dealing with cases of this kind would be reasonably rejected if it did not require agents to treat the, the claims of each person who could be saved as having the same moral force. So, can we reject this principle? Can we reject the principle that says that, well, when you don't have any special ties with any people, you uh, you must give uh, you must give them equal uh, moral uh, moral force. Well, the answer is no. You can't really uh, really reject this. Uh, the principle uh, and the argument uh, justifying it is perfectly valid and sound. When you have to choose between two groups of people, you save the group with the bigger number. So. Does this mean that contractualism is dead, or is this, you know, a, uh, a dead end for contractualism? Well, not necessarily. Like, hold on a second here. Remember that the, aggreg the, aggreg the aggregative justification is about maximization of a certain value. But here, it's not about maximization of a certain value, but about considering the positive weight of each individual's life equally. 
So we didn't add the moral weight uh, of the people in a, in a group and compared it with the sum of another. We just find that if we save the group that has less people, we'd be failing to recognize the moral significance of other people. So the people uh, in the smaller group, they cannot complain that their lives were not taken into account or given equal importance as the rest. So as Kevin says, it would be reasonable to reject a principle for deciding what to do in these cases that did not give positive weight to each person's life. It would also be reasonable to reject a principle that did not give each person's life the same importance. So we agree that saving the bigger group is the right thing to do, but not because of an aggregate, but rather because it is the result of giving to each person the same importance which is owed to each one of them. So if I save the group in which there are two people instead of four people, then what I did is uh, deny the importance of two people in the other group. I didn't give these two uh, individuals the same uh, the same positive weight of their of their lives that I did to the two others in the other group. So uh, so in this way, uh, contractualism is working and it doesn't need to appeal to uh, the greater to the greater number. It just appeals to the fact that there are some people uh, to whom I didn't give what I owe to them a positive uh, recognition of uh, of the of, uh, of the weight of uh, of their lives. So. Uh, Skellin also considers another principle to save the bigger group, uh, and it's called the uh, principle of proportional, uh, proportional chances. Uh, proportional chances is when you have to decide between group A, which has four people, and group B that has maybe five people, and you can leave it to chance to decide which one would be, uh, would be saved. But it won't be a random lottery. Rather, you're going to have to give higher chances to B rather than A. Like uh, group B would have 55% chance of survival while, while A would have uh, about only 40%. And so this would have the advantage of not only considering the equal importance of each life, but also give each person a chance, a chance to be uh, to be saved. But uh, Skellen says that this second principle of proportional chances isn't convincing for two reasons. First, it doesn't address the big issue, which is that there is uh, harm at stake here. It doesn't say that uh, it doesn't say what uh, what to do about the harm. It just looks for the better procedure to inflict it. Uh, like it uh, would discard the substantive reasons that the people in the bigger group uh, have for preferring the other principle about considering everyone's life equally or fail to see its uh, pervasive force. So it doesn't uh, do justice to the principle of equal importance. And the second reason why this uh, principle uh, is, uh, is not uh, reliable and can be uh, rejected, um, it's because it doesn't offer substantive reasons for the smaller group to reject the principle of equal importance. Like sure, the principle of equal importance rules out the chances of the smaller group to be saved because um, because the answer is obvious that we are saving the bigger group, and so the smaller group has reason to hold on to the proportional uh, chances principle. Uh, at least with that, they have a chance to be uh, to be saved. But that doesn't mean that this would reject the principle of equal importance. Uh, the small group cannot reject the principle of equal importance, whereas the bigger group can reject the principle of proportional uh, proportional chances because it would discard the importance of their lives so in fact the proportionate uh, chances principle doesn't give equal importance to each life it just puts it uh, just puts it there but doesn't give it its uh, persuasive force with the other principle however everyone is giving their due uh, the person who is not being saved isn't in an unfair situation because the importance that she uh, she was owed to was given to her uh, this however doesn't mean that the uh, proportionate chances principle cannot be applied elsewhere when there is a uh, majority versus a minority uh, Scallon explains in a footnote uh, that in cases of elections for example the proportionate chances would meet the criteria of non uh, uh, rejectability if for example we make elections by lottery it would be uh, 
it would uh, it would give subst substantive and uh, it would be given substantive and strong reasons for the minority to uh, hold that principle to hold to that principle of you know the, of the chances uh, since it would guarantee that the minority has equal access to political power as the majority but in such cases the principle of equal importance is just irrelevant and so the proportionate chances would have all the persuasive uh, forces there uh, in other cases, the principle can have more weight, uh, like in, uh, in an example given by uh, John uh, Brume, uh, another, another philosopher mentioned in, uh, in a footnote. Uh, the example says that when you send someone on a suicide mission because they have the skills that would uh, make the mission more likely uh, to be successful, uh, that can be unfair to that uh, person. You know, that person has the same... Uh, has the same, you know, uh, right as anyone else not to die. So sending him on a mission, knowing that he won't make it back just because he has the skill is kind of unfair. Uh, in such cases, uh, Brume argues that what would be fair is to decide on a lottery to know who to send on the suicide mission. It doesn't, um, uh, it doesn't have, you know, to, uh, to be you know because you have the skill so you are the one who, are, who is going to go uh, on the suicide uh, mission well i don't know but i don't really agree with this uh, this reminds me of chernobyl uh talking about the series where uh, the government had to send miners to save uh, to save the population from radiation in the soil and it was a suicide mission because the miners would die from the radiation but as long as they could do the job they weren't going to uh to do a lottery to decide who to uh, who to send so uh you need you need actual miners people who know how to dig tunnels and all of that to uh, to do that job period but the point is that skellens contractualism can answer to why setting the bigger number is the right choice without having to appeal to aggregative uh, justification you know that's the challenge and scanlon seems to have succeeded in uh, in addressing this uh, this challenge um, we can consider another example where aggregative justification would justify the uh, wrong moral choice. Uh, Skellen says, uh, imagine a guy named Jones uh, who got hurt bad in an accident while working uh, in a TV station, that is, broadcasting a football World Cup game to millions of uh, viewers. So Jones got his arm trapped under a heavy device that is crushing his bones uh, and he is in intolerable pain and the only way to take off the device is by turning uh, the power off in the station for like 15 minutes. So this means that in order to save Jones, the viewers can't, uh, cannot watch their ongoing game for 15 minutes. So to save Jones, one must apply the following principle. If one can save a person from serious pain and injury at the cost of inconveniencing others or interfering with their amusement, then one must do so no matter how numerous these others may be. So if the viewers don't want to miss on those 15 minutes, then they'll have to reject this principle. But could it be done? Can you, uh, can you reject this principle? Can this principle be rejected? And Scanlon argues, uh, well, it cannot. In order for it to work, the viewers must hold that either each one of their inconveniences is worse than the pain Jones is suffering, or that the sum of their minor inconveniences would result in a pain worse than Jones. And so the first answer is wrong. None of the viewers can be in worse or equal pain than Jones if they miss the 15 minutes of the game. And the second answer is absurd because for it to work, there has to be an, uh, an entity that is unified like an individual to experience that aggregate of pain that uh, you know that is going to be added but there isn't no one is no individual is going to experience all that aggregate of pain together no one is uh, so in short no one is going to be suffering and no one is suffering as much as, uh, as uh, jones yet the aggregate arguments act as if the sum of the pain uh, of these minor inconveniences would be relevant when no one can experience all that pain at once. So if we imagine a scale of pain between 1 and 10, 10 being the most unbearable pain, and there's someone who is suffering at 8, so very high, very high pain. If I say that in order for that person 
to be relieved of that pain, everyone else have to suffer suffer a uh, you know a on on the scale a two on the scale for like a few minutes. You can say that it's uh, that it's okay for that person to suffer an eight just because each uh, person doesn't want to suffer a two. Or if we get all the twos together, we get uh, we get uh, an eighty or something like we we go we go beyond you know the the ten. Uh, the 10 eight times uh, but someone can say that um, <coughs> sorry someone can say um, uh, that would also mean that we cannot have aggregative justifications for benefits either like we cannot sum up benefits but there has to be cases where summing up benefits can be a good and efficient way to offset larger costs uh, larger costs for individuals uh, and so we can uh, we can look uh, look again at the same uh, at the same case with Jones, but this time in reverse. Let's say that we can create so many more uh, transmitting towers that would improve the viewer's experience, but then uh, more workers run the risk of suffering the same fate as Jones. Uh, what principle can we use to? Uh, to then have better high quality image or sound if not the aggregation of benefits uh, we're not going to stop you know uh, we're not going to stop ourselves from having HDTV because accidents like Jones can happen doesn't this mean that uh, there is an aggregate of benefits that outweighs the cost of workers getting their arms crushed and the answer is quite easy actually Skellen says that in our example of Jones, the point wasn't about intentionally causing harm or pain, but about failing to prevent an accident. What is required is just to argue if the precautions for not having such accidents occur have been taken or not. There is no need for aggregation of benefits here. Uh, all you need to argue is that you've taken all the precautions necessary and that can be uh, that can be thought of in a reasonable setting without making our need for security you know for example stifling like uh, like it often is and when it is uh, when it is not it's often uh, in the wrong things uh, so like uh, Skellen says we first need to determine if the level of care is adequate and if the standards for this care have been met uh, and so none of these questions depends on the number of people watching the game. Uh, that workers would be doing things of high risks for building a bridge, for example, isn't a question of how many people will benefit, but how uh, how each person will benefit. Uh, in the footnote, Scullin says that there can be cases where we think that the number counts, like when you try to protect a town from uh, dangerous floods, you can ask uh, from workers to take risks that are too high for that project. And so the only reason you can justify why the workers would take such risks is from uh, the aggregative uh, benefits of the majority. But that's not how it works. Rather, you make the workers do those dangerous things because you know how devastating floods would be on the lives of each single individual, including the workers. And so this again, um, this too is about how much precaution was taken. Uh, even for the workers who made the whole, uh, the whole thing and took the risks, those risks has to be minimized to a maximum degree. If the workers refuse to do the job saying that it puts too much of a burden on them, the residents of a town can tell the workers that they took all the possible precautions available and, uh, and the precautions that they could think of. Uh, whether or not this will lead to an agreement between the parties isn't the issue. What Skellen is saying is that the argument from aggregation cannot be sufficient to reject principles or justify them. Instead, the only aggregation that can have an appeal is an internal one and individual one. Quote, the contractualist argument I have just stated includes a form of aggregation, but it is aggregation within each person's life, summing up all the way Summing up all the ways in which a person demanding a certain level of care would constrain that, uh, that life, rather than aggregation across lives, adding up the costs or benefits to different individuals. So, for Scanlon, the aggregation across lives, like the interpersonal one, that's just an illusion. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we... Uh, 
that you can ask workers to build a building that is very dangerous to make despite all the precautions taken, just so that only a few people would use it either. Scanlon says here that um, we might think that, uh, sorry, um, <coughs> that uh, what will reject this project is an interpersonal interpersonal aggregation like you show that the building uh, serve uh, the building uh, will serve just a small number of people and that would provide only a small amount of benefits compared to the cost that it would put on others but you can still argue from uh, aggregation within each person's life to reject that project. I mean, what kind of building is necessary for just a few people to have many workers put their lives at risk? Whatever reasons people have to want that building can be rejected on so many reasonable grounds that, that don't require an interpersonal aggregation. You can just reject it on the principle that it is not allowed to make someone suffer so much uh, so that a few people would be spared some minor inconveniences. Workers putting their lives on uh, the line for projects that they uh, that they uh, too would benefit from, uh, you know, that their kids, friends, and families or others can, uh, you know, can. Uh, uh, can also, you know, benefit, benefit from, that would be reasonable to ask of them uh, to take the high risks. But if it's, uh, if it's, if it's done so uh, that only a few people would benefit from it, then it's not. It's not reasonable to accept that. So to sum up, contractualism supports a principle according to which in situations in which aid is required and in uh, which one must choose between aiding a larger or smaller number of people, all of whom face harms of, uh, of comparable moral importance, one must aid the larger number. On the other hand, contractualism does not require or even permit one to save a large number of people from minor harms rather than a smaller number who face much worse much more serious injuries. So um, it's only when the uh, harm in question is equal to everyone that we can justify saving the greater number of people. But if there is a difference in one harm, the number can no longer uh, be relevant in moral argument. But this still has two objections. Um, the first one is about this distinction between the degrees of harm in uh, one case, uh, where harm is of equal uh, of equal degree, the number counts. But when it's not of equal degree, the number is irrelevant. And so this can lead to situations where we have the following situation. Uh, can lead to situations in which we have the following situation. <laughs> uh, so let's uh, let's go back to A, B, and C. Suppose that uh, person B and person C are facing terrible pain, and person A is uh, is too in a terrible pain, but his pain is slightly worse than B and C. Would it be justified to save A just because his pain was slightly worse than B and C? Shouldn't we save B and C in the situation and let, you know, A bite it? Uh, and so Scanlon says uh, that his contractualism doesn't take uh, doesn't, you know, it, it, it doesn't become technical to that point, which he believes is quite unnecessary. I mean, moral significance is more efficient when we, uh, when the differences between cases are broad ra rather than, you know, narrow, uh, like in cases uh, like B, uh, B and C are going to, uh, to lose two fingers, but A will lose three. Right uh, for Scanlon, when there when there is just slightly differences, we just consider the situation as equal unless someone can prove that slight difference would actually make a difference. And so the second objection is to say that um, Scanlon uh, chose two cases that are extreme. Uh, on the one hand, we have cases where the harm is equal, and on the other, is significantly different. If uh, all of the vast majority of cases involving harm were like that, uh, ethics wouldn't be that difficult. But the reality is that between these two extremes, there are many in the inter intermediate cases where contractualism cannot help us in deciding what to do. Uh, take the following example. Uh, in the case of you have to choose between saving someone who is drowning and warning all people on a beach not to get into uh, the water because it is polluted uh, and then spend the next two weeks throwing up and shitting their pants, clearly you have to save the drowning person since you're going, uh, the, since the, uh, the, the, drowning, the drowning person is going to suffer a worse harm. But if the choice was between the drowning guy and the preservation of a more serious harm, uh, 
like losing arms or going blind or paralyzed, like maybe uh, there are uh, dangerous chemicals in the water that can cause that level of harm, then contractualism can't really help us here. But here too, Skin reminds us that his contractualism is quite flexible uh, because because he says uh, that in such cases, we can just consider which one uh, do we have more chances of saving. Even if I have a principle that tells me that I have to save the drowning dude, that principle can be rejected if I consider that I have more chances to save someone from going blind than the drowning person. So here, uh, so uh, th there are harms that, although aren't as bad as drowning or dying, can still be prioritized simply by the fact that we have higher chances of preventing them than the ones that are worse. Uh, this, uh, so the question becomes, quote, it is, it is clear that uh, faced with a choice between saving one person's life and saving another from complete paralysis, where no uh, other factors are relevant, we must choose the former. Then is it, uh, then is it so, uh, so clear that we uh, would be required to let one person die in order to save a very large number from being paralyzed? So for, uh, for Skellen, this question depends on how relevant the harm is for moral argument. If a harm is serious enough to be relevant, then the answer is yes. Like the harm of missing 15 minutes of a football game isn't relevant when it's about saving a man from losing an arm, no matter how many people are watching the game. But when the great number is facing a more serious harm, like total paralysis, and one person is going to die, the harm from paralysis, uh, though uh, less evil than death, becomes relevant. It would be better to save the majority from paralysis than one guy from drowning. So in short, contractualism uh, provides the following cases. One, in case you have to choose between one protecting one or two uh, multiple people from the same harm, you take the second option. In case uh, you have to choose between one protecting one person and two protecting someone else from the same harm and another person from a lesser harm, you have to take the second option. In case you have to choose between one protecting someone from a serious harm or two protect many from minor conveniences, you choose the first option after having assessed that the conveniences are not morally relevant. And four, in case you have to choose between one protecting uh, one person from a uh, serious harm or two protecting many from serious harm, through, though uh, less serious than, uh, than in the first uh, option, unless you had more chances of saving the person in the first option, you choose the second option. So, uh, to end this long section before concluding the chapter, Scanlon says that arguments for moral justification based on aggregation are insufficient and therefore contractualism offers a better alternative. Uh, what makes an action right or wrong isn't the total benefit it produces, but whether or not the principles on which it is based can be rejected or not on reasonable grounds and from various standpoints. However, contractualism can make cases where the number is relevant uh, through what he calls the tie-breaking argument, that's another name for the equal importance of moral uh, significance argument. Uh, Scanlon says that he didn't uh, show really how contractualism can make room for aggregative uh, arguments, except superficially, but he says that contractualism doesn't really exclude them. Uh, maybe that's kind of a bl blind spot in his uh, moral theory, but anyways, let's just conclude this, uh, this chapter. So, this chapter was about determining the structure of contractualism. We centered on three main ideas, the idea of reasonableness, the standpoints of individuals, and the generic reasons that arise from those standpoints. So, in, contract uh, in contractualism, uh, individuals raise generic reasons for their specific standpoints in order to reject principles on reasonable grounds or suggest ones that cannot be rejected on reasonable grounds. Uh, generic reasons must be personal reasons, meaning that they cannot be abstract, but they, uh, but they too can be too specific. Personal, uh, personal here means that they arise from specific situation and must be appropriate to similar situations, but they cannot be specific in the sense that they apply to only the individual who uh, raised them. 
like generic reasons, cannot be about proper names, but about standpoints. Also, even though they are personal, they can't be uh, about well-being, since uh, we've seen many times that well-being isn't a sufficient reason to reject or adopt a principle. Also, well-being is often used as an aggregative argument across lives, and as we said, uh, since generic reasons arise from individual standpoints, aggregative uh, arguments are not really uh, are not really relevant. Um, there are a few exceptions where the number plays a role, but as we've seen, those cases are still grounded in individual standpoints. When it comes to determining whether or not principles are to be rejected, uh, Scanlon proceeds in two ways. We can either uh, proceed downwards, like we start from the general idea of constructualism, and so we reach conclusions about what would constitute a good ground for reasonable rejection. We take impersonal reasons, and uh, we need to know if they can reasonably reject a principle. We start by stating what constructualism is, and we see if impersonal reasons fit the description. And when they don't, so they can't uh, be good grounds for reasonable rejection or we can uh, proceed upwards. Uh, here we start with a principle that's obviously or intu intuitively rejectable, and then look for what reasons can we have for formulate that rejection. A way to do this is by comparing the consequences of the implications of a given, uh, of a given ground of rejection in other similar cases, and see if that ground works. We ask what would happen if we apply these reasons to other cases similar to the, ones we're, to the one that we are in. Uh, and so the second procedure can be problematic, as in any idea that appeals to intuition. The use of a theory should, uh, should be to avoid having to rely on intuition, uh, it needs to make uh, everything explicit and clear from the start, especially when we are dealing with ethics. Uh, so saying that we can intuitively know what is reasonable and what is uh, and what is not actually, you know, uh, is actually, you know, counterintuitive. So here Scanlon discusses uh, John Rawls, uh, the original position argument, as an example of a theory that tries to leave aside all claims to intuition. Uh, the original position is basically the position you occupy in the veil of ignorance. It's when you don't know anything about the position that you will occupy once you are born, and so you have to make abstraction of what you currently uh, currently know. So Rawls argue that from that position, individuals ought to proceed through deductive reasoning and not through intuition. Uh, to uh, to quote. Um, uh, so this is uh, Scanlon quoting uh, Rawls. Uh, that is a simplified situation. Uh, that is a specified situation is described in which rational individuals with uh, certain ends and uh, related to each other in certain ways are to choose among various courses of action in view of their knowledge of the circumstances. What these individuals will do then uh, is derived by uh, strictly deductive reasoning from these assumptions. So. Uh, so that's, uh, that's Scanlon quoting uh, Rawls for, uh, in, a, in a footnote. But Scanlon argues that to be able to extend contractualism to this level of theory, like to make it able to discard intuition, um, that's kind of implausible. Uh, we shouldn't go uh, as far as, you know, uh, discard intuition. So we are going to extend con contractualism uh, but if we are going to do that, it's not at the expense of intuitive reasonableness altogether. Uh, if we are going to extend contractualism to make intuition disappear, we'll then have to rely on some sort of master value like well-being, which will serve as the basic metric for morality. It would lead to welfarist contractualism, and we've already seen the problem uh, that, uh, that it has. So with regard to Rawls' position, it would be primary social goods instead of well-being, uh, like any decrease in those um, any decrease in those goods will be bad, whereas an increase, uh, increase would be good. So what constitutes uh, good grounds for rejecting principles would be the effects of those uh, principles on the social goods left to individuals. Uh, social welfare is a social good, a principle that makes rights, liberties, power and opportunities, uh, wealth and income, uh, self-respect and all of that inaccessible for some would have a negative effect, so we can reject it. But Rawls' principle has some limits, uh, although it uh, the, the take on social goods is 
is, is very good. Uh, the principle has some limits. Uh, to sum it up, it states that a basic social structure is just, uh, is just so long as it offers social goods to the members of a society. Uh, what then the members do is their own responsibility, whatever goal, uh, goals they'll, uh, they'll set for themselves. Uh, will they be happy or unhappy, successful or, unsu or unsuccessful? It is entirely their responsibility. So here what is considered in the moral uh, sphere of what we owe to each other is simply the social goods. Uh, the moral framework of roles only limits morality and reason to provide the social goals uh, that we want to be guaranteed. Uh, it is to assure ourselves of the bundle of primary social goods. So here uh, we are talking about substantive claims about what social institutions are to be uh, uh, like how uh, how social institutions are to be judged, uh, do they guarantee or not these primary uh, these primary goods, and also about the relative role of institutions and individuals. Uh, so Scanlon here addresses three points in Rawls' theory. The first point is the following: although these are plausible claims about the particular case of uh, justice of social institutions, it does not seem likely that there are equally plausible claims about the morality of right and wrong in general, which is the subject of the contractualist theory I am proposing. So he points uh, first, uh, he points out that while these assumptions are plausible for evaluating the social or uh, and uh, the, the, the justice of social institutions, they may not apply equally to the broader scope of, moral, of moral philosophy, which here is what we owe to each other. Um, Scanlon argues that morality, particular, uh, particularly obligations and responsibilities, involve diverse considerations such as, you know, wrongful conduct, the creation of situations leading to broken promises, engagement in uh, risky uh, conduct and uh, misfortune, uh, that requires aid, and so these considerations cannot be easily categorized into a list of primary goods, as you know the moral significance of factors like intent, knowledge, and alternative courses of action varies across different circumstances. Like you cannot have an institution that tells us what a moral division of labor, uh, for example, would look like. Uh, that would rely on the responsibility of the individuals, their intent, their knowledge, and their standpoints, like we've seen with the example of the workers doing a dangerous job to protect the citizens. Uh, so that situation depends on so many variables that no fixed list of social goods can account to. And so same thing with breaking promises or, or, or with uh, voluntariness. Uh, these are cases where when you do something involuntary, involuntarily, uh, no one can blame you but others, where even if your fate isn't your own doing, no one has a duty to help you, just like there are cases where even if a promise wasn't uh, volunt uh, voluntarily given, it is still binding. So social institutions cannot provide a fixed list to the social goods when the situation in question involves cases like the one just stated. So here what uh, should be done is, as Kellen says, what uh, what one uh, what one can do at this general level, and what I will try to do in the following chapters, uh, ch chapter sorry, is to investigate what it is that giving that gives these various elements of voluntariness, uh, knowledge of circumstances, availability of alternatives, and so on, their moral significance, why they are. Uh, factors that people have reason to insist that accept uh, that acceptable principles should take into account. So, if you want to uh, to remove completely the intuitive aspect of reasonableness, you're going to uh, to restrict yourself to a very narrow range of what can be considered right and wrong. Claims about justice and social institutions are not just political philosophy, uh, they are also about moral questions. But morality is precisely about more than just that. It is, uh, it is more than just how much social goods I can guarantee to others. So in short, Scalin contracts, uh, contrasts sorry, uh, Rawls' original position argument with the more general contractualist idea of reasonable rejectability in moral philosophy, which leads to the second point. The second point is that it is misleading to contrast Rawls' original position argument with an upward 
argument of contractualism with an appeal to intuition, let's say. That's because both the original position and Scanlon's contractualism rely on the same judgment. Uh, roles need to provide substantive judgments about the subject of the original, uh, the original position, like judgments about the proper goals of institutions uh, or the division of labor between institutions and individual rights uh, and individuals sorry uh, some uh, and so some things here won't be acceptable in the footnote there Scanlon reminds us of his rejection of proper names because they are likely to rig the game for others and make it unfair so the use of proper name in elaborating principles uh, will lead to a situation where some are systematically favored over others without justification so both the original position and contractualism accept this judgment uh, that principles uh, that favor some over others for no valid reasons must be rejected so the veil of ignorance in roles uh, in roles cases uh, in roles case sorry allows one to uh, avoid looking for principles that favor their own uh, condition since they have no knowledge of the conditions that they'll be in. But as Scanlon says, the reason for imposing this veil of ignorance lies in the judgment that people would have reason to accept principles of justice that emerge from the original position only if it is a fair process in which no one is able to design principles to favor his particular condition. So, the judgment that uh, that people would have reason to uh, accept the principles of justice of the original uh, position is an intuitive judgment. Uh, it's just tighter than contractualism, but it is still an intuitive judgment. It's uh, building its downward argument within a framework of upward arguments, um, of upward uh, principles, sorry. So on that account, contractualism can do the same. You can have tighter accounts or versions of contractualism. As Kellen says, if tighter forms of contractualism, uh, one, uh, ones that lead to a wider range of substantive conclusions through a downward uh, argument are to be developed, this is most likely to be done through upward argument. And it's not that we, it's not that we cannot do this, we actually should avoid uh, intuition when possible. The issue is that you cannot avoid intuitive uh, judgments about right or wrong all the time, or you can make a theory that doesn't rely on intuition like at all. Um, what you can do is suggest forms of contractualism that, uh, that may clear the uh, methods of arriving at assessing moral judgments and rejecting principles, but not to... Uh, not to tighter accounts of right or wrong in general. And so the third point, so lastly, uh, the third point is that it is a mistake to assume that in order for moral theory to be appealing, it must reject any appeal to intuitive judgment. And what we must restrict ourselves to, uh, tighter accounts of contractualism. Uh, it is mistaking uh, because moral principles that can dispense with moral judgments that that often rely on uh, intuition are extremely rare and so on the other hand contractualism doesn't restrict us uh, this much and can be helpful to come up with new principles because well morality is uh, is always evolving so uh, to quote uh, to quote from the concur conclusion and to end uh, this uh, this video a general account of the kind that contractualism provides of the process uh, through which uh, moral principles are justified can undermine the plausibility of some principles such as those based on unrestricted unrestricted aggregative uh, reasoning and enhance the plausibility of others this may lead to the form uh, formulation of novel principles okay so that's the uh, chapter on the structure of uh, contractualism. So basically the advantage of contractualism is that it always leaves room for new principles, for discovering new principles or formulating new principles because, well, the situations are so uh, wide uh, and, uh, and, and varied. I mean, there is a range that is so wide when it comes to uh, moral situations and it is so... Uh, so varied and so um, to come up you know with I mean to questions about right and wrong they're always they're always open in the sense of there is always uh, new principles that you can come up with in new situations and 
uh, the form of contractualism that Scanlon is arguing for. Uh, well, it allows us to always keep on uh, looking for new principles and, you know, to, to never feel, you know, uh, never feel stuck uh, with, uh, with a morality that doesn't really, um, that is not really appropriate to the situations in which we have uh, arrived at. So, that's it for, uh, for this chapter. Next week we will start the, uh, the chapter, the sixth chapter on responsibility. And, uh, and likewise, it's, it's, it's a long chapter too, so I'm also going to, uh, to be doing two... Uh, it's the sixth, uh, the sixth uh, chapter. I'm also going to be doing two videos to cover uh, everything in that, in that chapter. So hopefully this is uh, helping you and uh, thank you for watching.